So I think it's time to officially get started with the talk. So welcome everybody to Breaking Dependencies Type Erasure. So I think by now most people know me, but just in case, my name is Klaus Igelberger. I'm perfectly happy if you stick to the first name. So I'm Klaus. And indeed, what I do for a living is I do C++ training classes, consulting, I've written a book. I'm organizing a C++ user group, the one in Munich, and I do some freelancing work at, at conferences. So, in other words, I do a lot of C++, which is not boring at all. The topic, I guess this is a topic that I really like to talk about. Design, software design, and in particular, I like this type erasure design pattern. So I have given a talk about this in 2021. I think this was the first one in a series. And I've talked about all the good properties of type erasure, which I believe are <laughs> huge. And, and there's an amazing amount of good things. So um, pretty much we, we resolve the solid principles really beautifully. We reduce duplications quite a bit. We get rid of inheritance hierarchies, pointers, manual dynamic allocations, lifetime, etc. So this talk was pretty much about the design. Why from a design perspective this is good to have and good to use. I did not really have the time to talk about the implementation details though, which admittedly might get a little tricky. And indeed, I also did not really have a lot of uh, time to prove that point, uh, the performance. Is this truly imp improving performance? And so this is kind of the second talk in a row, but don't worry, if you've not seen the first one, you will definitely get the point. So first, very quickly, in just a few slides, motivate the idea. Then I will um, actually do rerun of what I've done in the other talk for about 20 minutes. However, I will already start to talk a little more about the design, uh, sorry, the implementation details. And then we will talk about the optimizations, good ones that you can also use for all kinds of other things, but things that will potentially really make the difference why you might want to use this technique after all. Okay, so why using this type erasure idea? So let's assume we have some command, that command design pattern, a good old gang of four pattern, and we have all kinds of commands, print commands, search commands, execute commands, all kinds of stuff. And well, traditionally, classically, we would implement this in form of an inheritance hierarchy. This is pretty much exactly what we would find in this Gang of Four book. And it would, of course, pass by pointer to base. This is not really what we do anymore today, right? Immediately, some people cringe, look at this, ah, I would use a stood function, of course. This is pretty much exactly the same idea. I pass in something that I can call, something that returns a void and takes an int, but it's simpler. It really is so much simpler. I have the same commands that I can just pass without any kind of inheritance. And that's nice, that's beautiful. So there are no inheritance hierarchies, and this is totally non-intrusive. You can start to use this even though you might still have an inheritance hierarchy. You don't have to change any code to get this working. This is amazing. We have less dependencies. Uh, also, there's no base class that tells us what exactly we have to do. We can implement these commands as we sit fi see fit. That's great. With less pointers. And in fact, in this little example, I have zero pointers. I have not any uh, allocation in my end. And so I also don't have to take care of any lifetime. That's great too. It's simple because we have values. Values instead of pointers and references. I would argue this is one of the big changes that modern C++ brings us. We prefer to use values. It's just simpler, but really, this is simple. And potentially we have even better performance. Good stuff. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big list of very positive attributes. Now let's take a look at a second kind of similar example. Let's say that we have shapes. I don't know, my classic example, and come back to this in a bit. Um, we have different kinds of shapes, circles, squares, and triangles. And again, classically, we would use an inheritance hierarchy to do that. But again, this is not really what we do anymore. This is kind of the old style, when we didn't know better. Now today, we would use a value, a shape. It kind of encapsulates all of this, and it you can just um, uh, equip with circles, squares, triangles, or any other kinds of shape. 
And so that's pretty much the same thing I've shown before, just with a different problem. And it has the same properties. No inheritance hierarchies. It's non-intrusive. Anybody can bring a new shape, and this will just work. Uh, there are less dependencies because of that. Less pointers. And again, no pointers here. No manual dynamic allocation. No manual lifetime management. Values. And so it's simple. It really is simple, which is, from my point of view, probably the most important thing. And again, perhaps, perhaps you know, the performance is a little better. We'll see. So this is what we want to do. This is just better. So this is not a new idea. Um, this is now quoting the pragmatic programmers from 25 years ago. Yeah, the, the, from the book, the pragmatic programmer. Inheritance is rarely the answer. So what do you use instead? What do they say? Well, more composition. And that pretty much is what I'm going to show. We built on composition. And so type duration might indeed be the answer that we've been looking for for, uh, yeah, for a couple of years, perhaps even decades. With this, I do not want to claim, and I should stress this for real, I do not claim that this is the one solution. Oh, this would be totally wrong and totally inaccurate. But it is a great solution that we can use for many, many of our applications. All right, so let's take a look at how this stuff works. By means of a simple example. Before that, though, yeah, I, I should make clear what I'm actually talking about. The term type erasure is pretty heavily overloaded. And unfortunately, yeah, you, you might, might get a wrong idea. So type erasure is not a void pointer. Yeah, sure, I know. It, it, nobody officially claims I'm using void pointer. But it kind of gives you the idea there is no type. Now, I've lost all the type information. Type erased. That's not what, what I'm talking about. Then pointer to base. Again, I'm kind of losing type information by going to the base class, but again, not what I'm really aiming for. And also something I've heard too much, unfortunately, std variant. So out of this list here, std variant is definitely the thing that definitely is not type erasure, because you see the types right in the type of variant. Yeah? You, you enumerate them. Yeah? This is definitely not anything um, that has to do with type erasure. Now, what I will be talking about is a templated constructor in a class plus a completely non-virtual interface. That's it, kind of. If I, again, take a little venture into design, then it is a little more, of course. It is a combination, a very good combination of a couple of design patterns, namely external polymorphism, bridge, and prototype. All right, let's take a look at this by means of this shape example. Uh, yeah, and I know. This is the point where a lot of people start to yawn. Oh my god. I, okay, I totally agree with you. Th this is a boring example. And this is also what my colleague um, um, Lucas Bechtol at some point said. I am tired of this example. But I don't know, no, I don't know any better one. That's the point. It, it, it is a classic example, which I know you which I believe you know. And that's a good thing. So you can entirely focus on the type erasure part and just ignore the rest. Now the rest should be pretty familiar. So we're going to draw a couple of shapes. So we're going to start with shape classes, like the circle. Pretty straightforward, nothing special. There's a constructor that takes everything the circle needs, at least the radius, a couple of getters, a couple of data members, great. Uh, there may be other shapes, of course, squares, triangles, rectangles, you name it, yeah, if anything that you need. The one thing that you should uh, note at this point is that none of these shapes has a base class. Good. And none of these shapes knows anything about drawing. Good as well. From a design perspective, this is exactly what we want to have. Why should the knowledge about what exactly to do be inside these classes? I want to separate this. There's a principle behind this. This is the single responsibility principle. So my circles, squares, and of course, all the other shapes don't need any base class. Then, of course, they should not know about each other. That's a pretty important point, too. And I don't need to know anything about their operations. Good. Then what I do have is, OK, I admitted at this point a base class. It's not called shape, though. It's called shape concept for reason at this point. 
But note especially it's after all the other shapes. Meaning this is not the base class that circles and squares need to know about. This is just some other base class. And then there is another class. Most precisely a class template that we call shape model. That shape model, that's the one class that truly inherits from shape concept. No other class needs to know about this base class. So this is the one, although of course it's kind of many. This shape model takes a shape T. So this shape T is well, any shape. This is circle, this is square, rectangle, any concrete kind of shape. And it stores one of these. So that's kind of it. It inherits from the shape concept. It's a class template that takes a shape T and it stores a shape T. That's it. Okay, of course, I cannot do a lot with this at this point. Therefore, let's add operations to the base class, as we would usually do. So perhaps you want to serialize two, but we most definitely want to draw. Pure virtual functions, because at this point, I just don't know what to do at this, uh, uh, with, with shapes. These, however, are now the affordances that must be implemented by the deriving class. And so we do. We implement this do serialize and the do draw in the derived class. What should you do at this point? How do we serialize or how do we draw a shape? Well, we don't have to know at this point. We can simply forward this to some other function, say free function, which I know again sounds a little shocking to some people, but Stay with me. This is not something we have to do, but this is now first, um, first approach. So we serialize and we draw. Okay. Then, um, yeah, this is what I just said. Note, do is merely just making possible that there is no name collision. So I call a free serialize function. Do serialize just uh, prevents that there's any, any, anything weird happening. Okay, so nothing, nothing special. All right. What I'm using here is actually not something that I invented. This is an ages-old design pattern. This is what we know as the external polymorphism design pattern. So it's not the shapes directly that have to build a hierarchy. It really has been externalized. The entire polymorphic behavior has been externalized. This is a pretty useful pattern this, that was described first in a paper in 1996. So it's not one of the Gang of Four patterns. It was kind of um, uh, described two years later, you know, after the book, but it's a pretty good read. So this here is pretty much what this, this design pattern tries to achieve. Allow C++ classes unrelated by inheritance and or having no virtual methods to be treated polymorphically. These unrelated classes can be treated in a common manner by software that uses them. So that's pretty much what you have just done. We have provided a completely unrelated uh, class hierarchy. Okay, so back to this. Oh, one more slide. So this allows uh, any shape to be treated polymorphically. Circles, squares, rectangles, they all have some kind of virtual behavior wrapped around them. This has helped us to extract the implementation details. Good, that is amazing. And it removes all kinds of dependencies to the operations. So again, circles, squares, don't have to know about drawing. Good. And this, of course, now creates the opportunity to extend quite nicely. All right, good so far. Then what else do we have to do? Well, we, of course, at some point need the operations, the real thing. Serialize, draw for both circles and squares. This is now a necessity because we call this from up in, in this uh, um, shape model class. These functions, however, they don't have to be implemented in one way. Oh, I can have many of them. So in, say, one file you implement draw with OpenGL, and say another file you use another library, VTK, uh, Vulkan, 3DX, whatever you have in mind. I can have many different implementations, which is nice. So by means of any mechanism that you'd like, from uh, compile time to runtime polymorphism, yeah, link time polymorphism included, you can now switch behavior quite nicely and non-intrusively. Uh, anything is possible. Draw shapes. Well, OK, this is a little function that just draws the shapes, and not just one, many of them. A vector of 
base pointers managed by Unique Pointer, I traverse all of these and I simply draw them, which is pretty much what I would use in an usual inheritance hierarchy, but um, now I just wrap this stuff. Okay, and so I put this together. In a main function where I first, okay, abbreviate this super long title a little bit. Yep, let's call this shapes. I create an empty shapes vector. I create a couple of shapes, and not in a usual way perhaps. So I create a circle in a shape model. Allocate this thing. Every shape model, whatever template parameter I give, is a shape concept, and so I can put it into this vector of shape concepts just as I could use any usual base class. And then I draw the stuff. Good. <sighs> However, you, you, you do not look excited. From its design point of view, this is already amazing. <sighs> but you look at me and say, Klaus, this is still good old object on programming. This doesn't feel modern. This feels uh, like 1996 or perhaps even 1994, goth-like. Okay, I hear you. So let's modernize this a little bit. Let's modernize this by just wrapping this, this external hierarchy in a class. So we put this into a class that we just name shape. Okay, and now you might get the idea why I had shape concept, different name. We needed the name, so we have now a shape. Particularly note that this inheritance hierarchy goes to the private section. External code will not care about this. This is a true private implementation detail of this shape class. All right. Then this class, of course, has a couple of more things. Most importantly, it has a data member, a unique pointer to a shape concept, a pointer to base. That's the thing that I used before. I, I just put it into the shape class and kind of hide the thing. And then I give this, of course, a public constructor. Yeah, of course, public else, how should I use this? This constructor, however, is not quite simple. It is a templated constructor that takes any shape T. Circles, squares, rectangles, whatever you have. It takes a shape T, so it deduces the type, and because it knows the type, it can instantiate the according model. So the shape model for that given type puts the shape in this model, allocates the thing on the, on the free store and assigns it to my pointer to shape concept because every model is a concept. So I store it by means of pointer to base. Okay, and that, that pretty much erases the type. So when you put a shape inside, say circle, uh, then you lose the information. You just have a shape, you have an abstraction. And that, that gives this technique the name type erasure. All right. Now, of course, there's a little more. Okay. okay, I should mention this too. That's again a design pattern. This is what we call the bridge design pattern. And this name might have given it away. That's a pimple. Yeah, so we have a pointer to implementation nicely hidden in this class. Nobody needs to know about this is my personal implementation detail. All right. Now, I want to serialize and draw shapes. Now, I introduce a couple of friend functions. Now, friend sounds nice, except in C++. Now, usually we don't have a lot of friends, but this is good friends, the real friends, yeah? This is friends that we call hidden friends. So it is not really member functions, it is free functions. Technically, these are now instantiated and, uh, not, not instantiated, but they injected into the surrounding namespace. So I can call them by passing a shape, but are only used when I really have a shape. So this is nice. This keeps the, the overload set small and convenient. All right, so I can now draw and serialize shapes. What I do inside, however, is kind of obvious. So I take my pimple and I serialize. Uh, or draw. Now I call the functions in the concept. And this will now draw the thing, whatever is in here. Because the virtual function will just go to the real thing, the model, and will do the real stuff. Nice. All right. So that's pretty much the idea of type erasure. Just wrap the thing in a, in a little class. 
Okay. Decilomorph, though. It's a shape. And naturally, if we're not talking about values, I want to be able to copy shapes. It's a very natural thing to do. But now I have a pointer to base only. Really, it's, it's type erasure. I kind of don't know what I have to copy. So this other thing also just has a pointer to base. What should I copy? Well, that's a common, common problem and a problem that you know might also know a solution for. So, in the base class, we now introduce another function. We introduce a clone function. Ah, some people not. I know that. I've seen this before. This is a correct a design pattern, yet again. They're, they're everywhere. Uh, once you realize what a design pattern is, you, you see them everywhere. You cannot avoid them. Uh, whether you use inheritance uh, templates or whatever, they're always there. Clone. The clone function in the base class is pure virtual, simply because I don't know yet what to copy. But the derived class, that implements this clone function and creates a copy of whatever it stores. Because the, the model knows uh, it stores a shape to you. So I simply copy the thing. Note that this is, uh, okay, this is what we call a prototype design pattern. And note, um, I used the copy constructor here. This is simple. This will always do the right thing. I don't have to think about this anymore. And if things change, if whatever I do um, changes this, this model class, this line will always be the right, do the right thing. Good. No, it's, it's robust and stable. All right. The copy operations now simply use clone. So I ask the other pimple to clone its content, and I will get a copy. I don't have to know what it is. And copy assignment, well, this is where the copy and swap idiom comes in quite handy. So in these two lines, I pretty much first call the copy constructor and then swap my, my unique pointer. Good. Some people now say, well, copy and swap, two lines of code is too much. OK. For those of you who feel this is already too much code, yes, of course, you can squeeze this into one line. It's the same thing, but for some reason, many people are pleased to see it uh, short. Cool. All right, copy. We can copy, so we have a natural shape. We can create copies of that without actually having to know what it contains. Now there's the move operations. Move actually turns out to be non-trivial. It entirely depends on what you want to achieve. So there are a couple of options how we can de uh, deal with move. Option number one, we can just default them. This is simple, perhaps even super convenient. But note that, of course, I have this pimple only. What happens if I move from a unique pointer? It's empty. So if you feel like, OK, an empty shape is something that I can deal with, that's natural, this is OK, then you can just default the move operations. But um, this is something that some people don't like. This does not really feel like values. If you copy a circle, uh, usually you do not uh, evict some circle and suddenly it's, it's empty. OK, so perhaps this is simple, but often not desirable. Okay, if you have, if you feel like there should be a default constructor too, then perhaps this is the option you're looking for because the default for unique pointer would be null pointer too. Option number two, um, we can just not implement the move operations. We can just omit them. And no, 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 I didn't say delete them. That is something different. If you delete the move operations, you forbid them. You say, no, 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 no move. That's, again, that would be very surprising for users. So you do not want to implement them. Because you have the copy operations, move would simply be gone. And if we attempt to move, would result in copy operation. So that definitely gives you value behavior. Nice. Except for the fact that, of course, now uh, you cannot move efficiently. And your move operations are not no except, because they allocate. Ah, OK. Also kind of simple, but perhaps not exactly what you, what you desire. And option number three, 
we do not implement the move constructor, but we do implement the move assignment operator. That may be perhaps kind of a mixture between the two I've uh, mentioned before. So, if we do not want our shapes to be empty, then we have to do something that the unique pointer is never null. This is something we can achieve by copying instead of move, uh, copy constructing instead of move constructing. But for move assignment, we could swap our pimple. And this is no except. So perhaps this is a tiny little bit better, a little more efficient in the case of assignment. But you see, this is interestingly not trivial. This is definitely something to think a little bit about, but it entirely depends on what you want to have. What do you want to have? What is shape for you? Is it a true value, like circle, square, etc., would be? Or is it perhaps a little more like a pointer, perhaps like an optional in some sense, that it could be empty? It's something you have to decide. So this is definitely an implementation detail. All right, draw all shapes. The little function that um, uh, draws shapes now takes a vector of shape values. Oh, this looks better. And it simply draws the shape. That's this little hidden friend. It draws the shape. That looks nicer. And talking about nice, oh, you haven't seen the main function just yet. That one is breathtaking. That is amazing. That's the, uh, the main function now. So we have a vector of shapes. This is this. We uh, start with an empty vector. We add a circle. We add a square. We add another circle. Wow. I know, this is the point where people usually don't say anything. <gasps> uh, so gasping is the only thing I usually hear because this is beautiful and simple. It's actually quite in, um, uh, unusual that we can just add different things to a vector. Yeah, but this is the abstraction, so we can really put different values in there. As long as it's a shape, as long as uh, all the affordances are implemented, this will compile. And I redraw it, and this will do the same thing. So, no pointers anywhere. Okay, now some critics will say, but Vector uses pointers. Yes, internally, we don't have to deal with pointers. Our life is simple, our life is easy. I do not have to allocate dynamic memory on my own. Again, Vector will do something, but we don't have to deal with memory. Good, simple. So we don't have to deal with lifetime management. It will just work. You will never have any, t uh, any, any problem with that. It's simple. It's values, value semantics, instead of pointers and or references. So the one thing that hopefully <laughs> was obvious, it's simple simpler code. And this, given that this entire discussion about um, safety, security, etc., that definitely is a very nice contribution. This shows that we actually have what we need. We have simple code that works without all these traps that we might, might usually have. Great. And so from this point of, uh, alone, this technique is just amazing. All right. There's a little more, though. You know, it's, some people are still not quite happy. Some people feel like, ah, oh, oh, these three functions. I want more. I want something more to, uh, to, to configure the thing. What can I do? Oh, there's a lot we could do. So right now we have the shape concept and the shape model class in the private section. All right. But nobody says that this is the only shape model. Oh, no. Internally, we can do whatever we want. It's, it's some hidden implementation detail. So why not just introducing a, a second class? Okay, I admit extended model is not a great name, but um, perhaps it's good enough. So we extend the model. How? Well, by allowing us to configure how to draw. And I'll just do this for draw and leave serialize alone. We can draw. This draw strategy is put in here. So note this extended model also is a concept. Any model is a concept or implements the concept. And I'm using now the strategy design pattern. And this here, oh, sorry, going back one slide. That here, that is the point where I now in the constructor take a draw strategy. 
and I store that draw strategy in addition to my shape. This could be anything, really anything. This could be something that uses OpenGL. This could be something for um, uh, VTK, 3DX, and this could also be something just for testing purposes. Some little thing that doesn't really draw but proves that everything is working well. It's even greatly and easily testable. Nice. Gets better and better. In addition to this first templated constructor, we need to just add a second one. One that also takes the draw strategy. Drawer, which I put into the according extended model, which again is a concept, so I can initialize my pimple with that, and this will work. Good. And so, uh, this is the point of dependency injection, of course. And so in the main function, I now have everything that I need to decide how to draw right here. So I'm now like uh, some output. I can do this by, for instance, passing a lambda. Nice. All right. I know all of you are looking pretty, pretty excited. All of you are now thinking, whoa, I have to do this right now. I cannot stay the third day for C meeting C++. I have to change my code base. OK, stay seated. We're not quite done yet. Um, so we have used it to extract implementation details. That is good, generally. We have created the opportunity for easy extension. That's what the open close principle usually tell, tries to tell us. We have separated the interfaces, good. We have reduced duplication a little bit, okay. Removed a lot of the dependencies. Yeah, circles, squares, and all these are kind of trivial classes now makes things simple. Um, we have removed inheritance hierarchies, removed all pointers, removed all manual dynamic allocations, the lifetime management issues, and improved performance. <sighs> performance. Ah, <sighs> performance. Performance is a tricky thing, you know. Once you mention performance in the room of C++ delivers, everybody is wide awake, and everybody is like, oh, I want to see the numbers. Okay, the numbers. That, that's always the problem. <laughs> if I don't show some numbers, there will always be some people that complain. Why, why didn't you show that? Why didn't you try that? Why didn't you use this? Ah. So, I will show you some numbers, but only if you promise me that you'll not complain afterwards. So, do you promise not to complain about the performance results, whatever I'm going to show? Okay. <laughs> no. It's always the first row, right? They're the most problematic. Uh, okay. So, unfortunately, I have the slides already. So, <laughs> and I know him. I know where he lives, so it's okay. So, um, what do I benchmark? Um, I have now a couple of shapes, actually four, which is still a, a relatively small number, but definitely better than just the two that I've shown. I generate 10,000 randomly generated shapes. Um, random means I try to hide it from the compiler, how many shapes, how many squares, etc. do I have. Then I run 25,000 translate operations. Okay, first thing to discuss, why translate? Well, because it's simple. Yeah, translate means moving the center point by some offset. This is simple, and it's the same for every shape. That is an advantage. So it doesn't really depend on how many circles, squares, ellipses, or rectangles I have. And, okay, the benchmark's a little older, so I used uh, GCC 11 and Clang 12. So, and, and yes, this is the machine I used for that, an 8-core Intel Core i7. All right, here are the numbers. The classic O solution that we started with is, okay, so fast. Okay, just numbers. The type ratio solution is, okay. Not better yet, but this is already a pretty important point from my point of view. We've improved a lot of things, but we did not lose anything from, for, for, from a performance perspective. It's just the same, which is not entirely surprising because after all, it's a virtual function call. But this is great, which means we now have the ability to optimize inside this class easily without having to change a lot of surrounding code. And this is now exactly what we'll do. 
So let's improve a little bit by two techniques that, um, that I want to show. And of course, there's so much other things that you could try. So let's start with the small buffer optimization. If you're not thinking about, ah, oh, haven't I heard this before? Small, small, small string. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what we do for a string class too, for very good reasons. It's, it's really important. Um, but now we do this, of course, for bigger things than just characters. So this is what we started with. This um, the shape class always, at this point, really always, for whatever shape I have, allocates. It always calls make unique, which in the end is, of course, just a new. That is something that we can definitely improve. What if we get a really tiny shape, like, say, a circle? A circle is small. Uh, it may, may contain perhaps a center point and a, and a radius. That is something that I might store right inside a shape object. All right, so let's do that. This looks a little scary right away, but I will walk you through. So let's first change this unique pointer to base into a byte array. <gasps> byte array. This is the first time people realize, oh my, this could actually work against, uh, but it will be turf totally safe, I promise you. So you now have to, um, of course, it stood byte, one byte. We have to decide how many bytes we need. At this point, trust me, we'll improve on that too. We just decide this is 128 bytes. And I put this inside the class so um, nobody can change that. It's an implementation decision. Then, super important, super important, never forget that, alignment. A byte array is not aligned. There's no other data member in the class that would realign this coincidentally. So we now have to make sure that this thing is properly aligned. How? I don't know. We don't know what we'll get. So we just take a guess. Say 16 bytes aligned. So it's a little over aligned. It might be sufficient for many cases, but this is just OK. So this is now put into this byte buffer. All right, this is now the thing where we will store all our objects, all of them, the circles, the squares, whatever you've got. But of course, again, wrapped in some model. So this is now, ex oh, this first. We have pimple again. But pimple is not a unique point anymore. It's now a couple of functions that do a re cast. cast. OK. And you thought it couldn't get any worse after the byte array, we now have a reinterpret cast. Okay, again, stay seated. It's, it's not as bad as it looks like. Um, this is safe. This is okay. This is the one thing that you can do. You can interpret bytes as the real thing. Now, this, the C plus standard says there is, this is okay. And since we have aligned this properly, there is no, nothing to worry about. We kind of know what we're doing, and it is very nicely hidden inside the class anyway. So the pimple function returns a pointer to the base type, interpreting the, the data that we have truly stored. All right, then the constructor. Now, now the constructor. The constructor still takes a shape T. We still need the model for this shape T. All right, however, we now have to make absolutely certain that everything we're doing is correct. So we now in, uh, assert statically that the size of this M is never bigger than the buffer size. It's less or equal than. So this is something we can of course do at compile time, which, oops, which uh, is great because we can never, um, never use something that is bigger than this buffer size. And then, we also check the alignment. Of course, now we can at compile time check the alignment of this model, which depends on the alignment of the given shape type. Um, so it's never overlined. Yeah? It always will fit in this byte array. And now if it does, we, um, we put this into this byte array with a placement new. So we at this uh, position, whatever pimple returns, we create the model that takes the shape. Good. So, note, and this is truly a small side note, 
we use a global placement new. That looks a little weird. However, experience shows that, yes, there are people out there. And no, 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 I'm not looking at you, not accusingly at least. There are people out there that actually overload place, the, the um, type-based placement new operator. <sighs> I know, hard to believe, right? They have no shame. But okay, in order to avoid that problem, we use a global one. And this is okay. Now this is much harder to, to change, so this will do the right thing. Okay, now some of you are thinking correctly, do we really have a place menu today? Is this something that we could use std construct at for the C20 algorithm? Oh, this is a great choice. We could do this. That's a little inconvenient though, because we have to pass a pointer to an M at this point. All Pimble gives us it's a pointer to concept though, so we would have to use another cast. I avoided this, I do it manually, but generally speaking, construct that would be a better choice, I, I believe. All right. Shape concept and shape model are pretty much unchanged from an interface perspective, but of course, a couple of details now do change. So it's still the external polyphism design pattern, but the, implementations has, ha, the implementation has to change. Clone no longer returns a unique pointer to something. No, no, no. There's no unique pointer involved anymore. Cloner takes a pointer to the memory where I want to create the new thing. So it takes a concept pointer. In the driving class, this is the memory location where I create the copy. So pretty much the same thing again, just that I take the memory address from outside. Okay. And again, I'm using the copy constructor, because again, this will always do the right thing, whatever I change in the model class. All right, it's the same pattern again, just well with static memory. There's another function, though, that might catch your attention. Move. Why do you move, need a move operation? Well, because sometimes we might want to move a, uh, some, some thing from this static memory into uh, this, this in-class memory to somewhere else. Of course, clone would work too, but there, there's optimization um, potential. So we introduce move that takes a concept pointer and implement this pretty much the same way except that we move the other thing. It's not empty though. It will be just moving the circle or the square. It will move the thing that is stored inside this model. It's just nice. So perhaps from this point of view, this is simpler from a um, semantics point of view. All right. Going to the uh, destructor. In the destructor, I'm using destroy yet. That's the right choice. Uh, destroy at the algorithm uh, instead of calling a destructor manually. But still, this is necessary. We create manually. We have to destroy manually. This is, it is required. So this is a little increase in complexity, but not a, not a lot. Destroy it is, is doing a good job here. Then the copy operations, super similar as before except that now I would copy into this buffer, and so it's a little bit about buffer swaps instead of the, the unique pointer swaps. All right, and move? Well, that really is simpler. We don't have to decide what is the semantics. Everything is inside the buffer. And so I simply would call the move operation instead of the clone one, and I uh, pretty much do the same idea yeah, here, move and swap in the move assignment operator again. So, the small buffer optimization. We can improve a little more. So, initially, I just decided we have 128 bytes and an alignment of 16 bytes. It's not, not a bad thing, not at all. Um, but, we might want to change that. We might want to, sometimes we want a smaller buffer, sometimes we might want to be, have a bigger buffer. Okay, so what could we do? Well, of course we could make these two template parameters. So we could say a shape has two template parameters, non-type template parameters, a buffer size and an alignment. 
And this would enable us to just configure this thing from outside. Okay. But we can actually do even more. What we have here is now uh, a shape that always stores in this in-class memory. It never allocates, which is great. So you have full control over memory. There's never any allocation. But of course, it limits. Uh, I can only use shapes that have up to 128 bytes. Uh, of course, we have to take into account that there is a model 2, and the model wraps some virtual functions uh, around this. This is another 8 bytes for the virtual pointer. Uh, this might be a little small. And so perhaps you want a little more flexibility. We can gain this by perhaps just providing a storage policy. At this point, we could say, well, sometimes you need just in-class memory. And sometimes I just want to allocate. And perhaps there is also some kind of hybrid idea. So again, I'm using a strategy design pattern to just uh, enable a lot of different behavior. So only dynamic storage, just something on the stack or in class, and potentially some hybrid storage. That's all it takes. I now can configure how the shape works. This is nice. But I should be honest, this is something that perhaps limits us in another way. So imagine we have now a shape for dynamic storage. All right, this is my shape one, whatever it contains. We might have another shape with another storage uh, policy. How would it work to copy from shape one to shape two? OK, that may be an interesting question. What about the hybrid storage thing? If I move shape one into that, how would that work? And uh, of course, the same is true for all kinds of assignment, copy assignment, move assignment. These mixed operations might now mess things up quite a bit. But I think this is, this is definitely a story for another day. This discussion would definitely go way too deep, way too deep. Uh, and of course, you know what happens if you dig too deep, right? Of course, you know. Yeah, all of us know. <sighs> it never ends well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the Dwarf of Samoria are now a little smarter if they would be alive. Okay. If, um, if you now use this smart buffer optimization, small buffer optimization, then the performance is drum rolls faster. A little bit. Okay, I know. This is the point where everybody was super excited. Ah! And now everybody is super disappointed. However, this is 10%, um, right? And I have to admit that in my experiments, I allocated up front and I just used the stuff. I actually do not reallocate uh, again and again. That would make an amazing difference. I don't have proof, but I've heard that people say, well, suddenly our performance was at 10%. Yeah? So we gain 90% of performance. It entirely depends on what you do. These 10% are just because I do not use free uh, the free stack, uh, sorry, the free store, but the stack. This is already quite, quite cool. And you know that in C++, a single percent performance improvement is already quite, quite attractive. So imagine that you come back to your company, do a couple of changes, use Tiberation, and suddenly gain 10% in performance. Whoa, you will be the hero of the entire company for at least a month, right? Very, very attractive. Okay, this is one thing we could do, and I believe this is definitely something that you should try, even if it looks a little meager. It actually works out really well. There's another thing, though, that I want to demonstrate. We have this... this nested inheritance hierarchy inside the class. Okay. But this, of course, means that for every type that we, that we put in this shape class, we introduce another virtual function table. And we also have these, this double dispatch. Now, not double dispatch, that's the wrong word, but we have these two indirections. The v-pointer brings us to the virtual function table, and from there, we actually find the real thing. That's something that we can improve because it's all happening inside the class. So we can manually implement virtual functions. Ooh. But it's actually not as bad as it looks like. So and I combine this by showing you something slightly different. 
something that I believe you really should see because from my point of view, this is way too good to not know. So say we have these circle and squares. I have a draw function that is supposed to draw the shape. And in the main function, I create a couple of shapes and draw them. Okay, with this one draw function, we could now just pass a shape. Const ref, whatever. Okay, this is nice. That's a function that works with an abstraction. With any shape, we can draw whatever we get, a circle, a square, etc. However, the keen observer will now complain because the shape might allocate internally. Just to draw a circle or square, we might actually yeah, allocate memory, create copies, uh, create a lot of effort. And this is something that people usually don't like. I should point out that this is, by the way, not just with our shape class. You have exactly the same problem with std function and any other type erasure type too. But there is something we can do easily in just one slide. We can implement something that I would call a shape view. Ah, that term already sounds familiar. A shape view. All right. So how does the shape view look like? So first of all, I introduce a templated constructor. All type erasure classes have a templated constructor. That, that's a given. That's part of the technique. This again takes the shape T. We do not want to allocate now, though. So how do we store any possible type that we get, any shape type? OK. He, okay. Just for the record, also for he, here in the first row, he said it. It's not my fault. <laughs> no, it's not. He said it. We use a void pointer. Oh. OK, people in this room thought it would not get any worse. Yeah, we would think I would not sink any lower. Once again, it was his suggestion. <laughs> but at least I make it better. <laughs> I have a void const pointer. <laughs> Much better. OK, because it's really a reference to const, pretty much like what, what string view is too. OK, so we take the address of shape, store it in this void pointer. We can take the address or, again, something to make it perfect, we can use std address of. Again, this is these, these little quirks. If anybody at this, any point would uh, overload the address of operator, this would do something weird, this works. All right, then. We introduce an operation by yeah, a, a function pointer. A pointer that returns void. This was our drawing thing. And it takes a void const pointer, one of these things. And I have a new data member. I have a, now really, function pointer. That's the type function pointer, which we might initialize to null pointer. Now, that operation now needs to be initialized. How do you do this? Well by means of a lambda. So in the constructor, in the constructor, I formulate a lambda, define a lambda that takes a shape. And because I do this in co the constructor, I know for sure what this shape type is. I know that. So I can type safely and easily, without any overhead, convert back from the void pointer to a shape T and draw the thing. Ooh. Okay, that's usually taking, usually takes a couple of minutes to sink in. Yeah, and you also have to overcome this, oh no, a void pointer feeling. But this is perfectly type safe and there's no allocation. There's no, um, no overhead except for, of course, the usual um, function call. Okay, and then just to be able to use it, and I'll restrict it to draw again, I introduce one of these hidden friends again, which just does all of this. So we take um, our little shape, so the given shape view actually, use the draw operation, and give that operation our shape pointer so that this here actually happens. And again, this is the free function from before. Wow, so a reference wrapper for, again, type erasure, but no allocation at all. All right, 
So what if I now use that? What if I use this technique to implement uh, virtual functions? Well, drum roll, it works well on some compilers. Some compilers actually like this a lot. So GCC in this case is, uh, is super happy about this. Um, Clang not so much. So of course they implement virtual functions a little differently, and so perhaps one is more friendly to the idea than the other. But still, what I've just shown, I would use this totally irrelevant uh, from uh, of, uh, of the performance. It just this is super super nice stand-in for any kind of abstraction. Yeah, string view kind of types for anything that you might have. Now the obvious question is, what if I combine the two? Would I gain something? Mm, I did not. So perhaps it was my implementation, but it did not turn out overly successful. Okay, perhaps it wasn't just my implementation. Feel free to experiment a little bit. Um, I don't know. All right, so which brings me to the summary. Type erasure is, first of all, a templated constructor plus a completely non-virtual interface and again, a combination of a couple of very useful, good design patterns. And I think this combination is just one of the most interesting design patterns today. Absolutely. Absolutely and without question. Because type ratio significantly reduces dependencies. It's one of the best ways I know to separate concerns. <laughs> Absolutely. It is about value semantics, something that is not just trendy, it's, it's definitely something that we are striving more, uh, for more and more. It does improve performance if we invest a little more into that, but it definitely does not decrease performance, good. It improves readability and comprehensibility. Okay, now this of course makes people complain again, but this was so complicated, you needed 60 minutes to explain it. Yeah, sure. But think about the surrounding code. Think about the main function that came out of this. Amazing. This is so simple for readers uh, that I think it really improves comprehensibility. Not inside the class, but outside, of course. And so it eases maintenance. If people can understand the code better, it's easy to maintain. And so I think this is a very good default choice. So this is why other languages use this internally. I don't see that, but uh, it definitely is. All right, thank you very much. Um, what uh, work? You may ask a question if it is not about performance. You promise not to complain, right? Okay, so about the performance that you showed. <laughs> Um, a small buffer optimization. Yes. So, um, two, two questions. Um, first, um, is there any reason why you didn't use align storage in, uh, instead of the binary? Align storage by now is deprecated. So, I thought there's probably a good reason why they don't like this anymore. And mm -hmm. okay. But uh, it is an alternative up to 20, I believe. Mm -hmm. I, I forgot. A s second question. What I don't like about um, the stack or hybrid approach usually is that it doesn't really compose very well when you have more in, in member functions. Do, do you know of any technique to, to reduce this? So space? if you truly exclusively use the in-class memory, I don't have any solution. Mm -hmm. it, it, it does not stack well, indeed. Mm -hmm. um, because you're limited in space. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and your, your shape type has a certain size, it does not fit in another shape. No, mm -hmm. this is something that you can only solve by dynamic memory. <laughs> Sorry. One more question. Hi, hello Klaus, thank you for your talk. Uh, this pretty much, at least the first part, resembles of uh, Sean Perrin's talk uh, about uh, content-based polymorphism. Uh, and uh, let's say my question is, uh, how would you uh, combat with boilerplate code that you need for a lot of class hierarchies in your in your code in your code base. I mean, this is, for example, one class hierarchy, but you have a lot of them in your code. So, how would you combat with that to re rewrite for every hierarchy? And the second question is, what is what is happening with polymorphic value? Uh, 
uh, type. Will we, will in, it ever get in the C plus plus twenty three, for example, or not? What is happening? Okay, twenty three is out. So uh, sorry, uh, in twenty six uh, yeah. at least. So uh, the first question first. Um, okay, I or, or, already forgot what exactly was the question. First one. <laughs> Okay, complexity. Um, I think overall the complexity is reduced because the surrounding code gets simpler. So you hide the complexity, encapsulate the complexity within the class. If you have a lot of uh, inheritance hierarchies though, I would not argue that you should replace all of this today with type erasure. It is a good thing, but of course changing things introduces bugs. If you have a very, very strong uh, test coverage, Perhaps this is a thing, but it still creates a lot of work and effort, and many people don't want to pay for that. So I think this is something to use for the next thing that you start, the next hierarchy. You could also start with uh, a type erasure thing and then uh, fade out the inheritance hierarchy because it's now inside the class. This is what we usually do. Yeah? Just rewrite things that use the thing, and once that is in place, you can just easily refactor the old thing and this is something that can take a lot longer time than if you first rem remove the hierarchy and immediately need a replacement. And so I think it's doable, and I think in the end there's less complexity. You have still to write some code inside, but it's all inside. Which now brings me to the last point here. Um, I'm not the first to say that this should probably be some kind of core language feature. Uh, Eric Niebler, a couple of years ago, actually um, for the first time said, we would like to be the uh, legs to be generated by the compiler. If I write a concept and describe the affordances, the compiler could generate such a type for me. Might be an option. Okay. Um, the second question, uh, I don't know exactly uh, what the roadmap is for polymorphic type. I don't know. Sorry. I, I take one from the yes. online audience. How about using curiously recording template pattern and you won't need type erasure or virtual place class and use concepts so we can make sure the type has the required functionality. Yeah. It is not, so CRTP, that was the question, is an alternative, but definitely a totally different area of design. This is dynamic polymorphism. CRTP is static polymorphism. If you don't need dynamic polymorphism, if you can resolve everything at compile time, you don't need this. You have other means to do things. I would not use CRTP, though. I would just use a concept um, and perhaps a tag class to say this is part of that group and th that's easier today. This is dynamic polymorphism, and so I think these two play in other realms. I think we are out of time. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.